All right, music fans, welcome back. Harmless Dave here talking about real music and cultural appropriation. Yeah. Um, and doing so in real time for a few real people out there just like you and just like me. So cultural appropriation is a real interesting concept. And I find it incredibly divisive. It's why we have the Cleveland Guardians baseball team right now. And we have the Washington Commanders, right? Isn't it the Commanders football team? used to be the Washington Redskins, used to be the Cleveland Indians. I mean, what gives? What's up with the Chicago Blackhawks, the Atlanta Braves? I mean, come on, people. Let's just get rid of it all. Um, none of that was done. Those names weren't chosen, by the way, to disparage certain groups of people. They, they just, it's, it's just not true. But as you know, time has marched on, we have become super sensitive, hypersensitive that now the lead vocalist of the uh, band Greta Van Fleet has to accept his ignorance and he apologizes for cultural appropriation. His name, of course, is Josh Kiska. He is the lead vocalist of Greta Van Fleet, which is a bit of a throwback band. And they, you know what? They decided to, to kind of embrace that Led Zeppelin image. We're going to wear cool clothes. That's probably what he thought. We're going to go full 70s and we're going to, you know, take a look maybe at Jimi Hendrix, who I think also violated all of these current norms uh, with the clothes that he wore. But maybe because he's an African American and Josh Kiska is obviously not an African American. I'm not sure all these rules, and I don't know how people um, follow them or obey them. And Josh actually has to apologize um, to you know, all of the people he supposedly offended. I'm not sure how many indigenous people were looking at Josh Kiska, were paying attention to Greta Van Fleet, but the story here, again, shows where our world is going. And you know what? It is kind of a brave new world. Let's just be honest. I mean, you wake up in the morning and you might be offending people and you don't even know it. You just don't even know it. And Kiska, who basically pleads ignorance here, and the article, it, it paints him as this ignorant rube, right? who's in a rock band and didn't really know he was offending the entire Chippewa tribe. And to me, this is just bizarre and it continues to get bizarre. Now, look, I'm sensitive to what this country did to a lot of different groups of people. Depending on your heritage, you can look back and say, yeah, when our people first got here, people who came from Ireland, people who came from Italy, people who came from Poland. I mean, you can go through the list. And of course, African-Americans. And then the native population, which was here already, they probably have the best argument, right? Because they were here first. I get that. But how many generations are we going to go uh, where we're just, no matter how much we do, no matter what we say, no matter how we repent, there really is no forgiveness. And this just goes on and on. In other words, we can never do enough. And that's the difficult thing, because typically when you say you're sorry for something, that's supposed to be the end of it. But it's never certain people make it so it's never the end of it. Oh, you said you were sorry, but I don't know if you really meant it. You know, and then the rules change again. And so Josh Kiska probably can't dress the same way he was dressing. He says in this article, he says, to our indigenous fans, I see you. I've taken the time to listen and gather my thoughts. My appreciation for indigenous culture is bigger than myself. So he's basically saying he appreciates the culture more than he appreciates himself, which is 
really kind of like groveling. That's like down on your knees, like the culture. Yeah. Um, it's more important than I am. Okay. Uh, I don't know how that is for any individual, but let's just go with it. He goes on to say, I recognize the harm that ignorance can have on marginalized communities, something I never want to perpetuate. Now, first, do we think that Josh did this on purpose, this crime, this crime of cultural appropriation? Did he, did he do it on purpose? Isn't he like 22 or something? I don't know how old he is now, but really young when this band started. Uh, and really almost taking the same path as Led Zeppelin, like when they got started and when this band got started. And you look back at all the cool clothes that Robert Plant, and then I would even say Jimi Hendrix and a whole bunch of other people from that era wore. And you could say back in the early 70s or late 60s, there was a ton of cultural appropriation going on. Um, the difference is, and this is a distinctive thing, we haven't evolved with our thinking. We've devolved because everybody could kind of get along in those days. And stereotypes were acceptable because people understood what those stereotypes meant and that there was a certain element of truth in stereotyping. There just was. Now you have to ignore blatant truths. Like you can't say, traditionally, this group of people over here dresses like this. Well, that's a stereotype. Some stereotypes are true. This is difficult thinking for a lot of people today because they can't accept it. So he says, I recognize the harm that ignorance can have on marginalized communities, something I'd never want to perpetuate. Hate, disrespect, and prejudice of any kind are not welcome in this community. I don't know which community he's talking about here. What, the rock community or the world community? As I've come into adulthood, so he's blaming you know, his youth for the ignorance, which quite honestly is a defense because uh, your brain isn't fully developed even as a teenager or in some cases an early 20 something, uh, you're pretty much thinking about yourself all the time. He says, I've been able to grow and learn. This growth has not stopped and will not stop here. The Chippewa tribe has had a particularly profound impact on my life, having been exposed to their ceremonies and customs during my early years growing up in Michigan. All right, so he's been exposed to their customs, right? And so, he probably thought these people are really cool. Wonder if I could dress like this. And <clears throat> nope, can't dress like this, Josh. Can't uh, can't show any influence that those early years had on you. I mean, look at what George Harrison, for instance, went to India. Right now, he was doing all kinds of cultural appropriating with the music that he brought back, but nobody ever criticized George. George, you're not supposed to play this kind of music. It's not your music to play. And all of the other musical influences from around the world. So if an American band wanted to bring world music influences into their, you know, their band and their recordings, um, is that permissible? Wouldn't it be cultural appropriation to bring in any kind of sounds, say, from countries like Africa? So you have to be from Africa. You have to be uh, of that origin in order to play music like that. You can't hear a sound or, or Celtic music, for instance, like from Ireland. Is that cultural appropriation? Can you culturally appropriate certain places but not other places? The rules to this quite honestly, are baffling. They're mind-blowing. And the more you examine it, the more, I guess, I'm a kid from Michigan, so I need to stay in my lane. And so if I bring in influences to the music or if I dress a certain way, I'm in violation of that. And I'm not celebrating 
those people, right? Why wouldn't it be considered, look at this, I'm drawing attention to this awesome culture. Well, you're not of the right lineage to do that. Your background is incorrect. Therefore, you can't do it. See what I'm saying? And so many rock musicians throughout history have borrowed and plagiarized and done so much uh, in ways that, I mean, anyone who plays uh, like a Bob Marley tune, like Eric Clapton covered Bob Marley, made a song, you know, a very couple of songs, I think, pretty, pretty good size hits, right? The one I'm thinking of is I Shot the Sheriff. That's obviously wrong based on uh, these new rules. You cannot take that song and use it. And then, you know, you're essentially just taking this culture and making it your own and you weren't born there, so you have no right uh, to do that. And that's where this all goes, whether it's the music, whether it's the customs, whether it's the clothing, uh, and it's hard to follow. Like I say, you'll get in more trouble for appropriating Native American culture probably than if you appropriated, say, a Celtic culture or an Irish or, I don't know, pick a country uh, that quite honestly doesn't have its roots in indigenous people or some marginalized group because they make the point of saying, well, these people are marginalized, therefore you can't culturally appropriate them. But these other people over here, they're not marginalized, so they're fair game. Okay, so it's exploitation when? When is it exploitation? It's just, this is too confusing. And because this group has no power, uh, therefore you can't quote unquote exploit what they do, which isn't exploitation, it's saying, wow, these people are very creative, they're very interesting. I'd like to dip into this, but you're not supposed to anymore. You can't do it. Whereas they've done it in the past. Paul Simon created a lot of music toward the end of his studio career that might be considered now as cultural appropriation. I mean, the musicians he utilized were from all over the world. And he recognized that this gave his music so much more uh, class and um, diversity and not in the, like, I've got to have this color or that color, but he really loved certain sounds and he knew the only way to get those sounds was to find people who are authentic. And again, I'm sure people now look back at those albums like Graceland and they're like, oh, this is what Paul Simon did. He stole all of this culture and worked it into his music. And then he took credit for it. You have to be pretty creative, by the way, to fuse those different styles and have it work. And I think Paul Simon did a great job. I think the other album is called Rhythm of the Saints. And they were both really good. And at the time, the music critics were like, this is Paul Simon's best work. I wonder if they've had time to reevaluate those two records uh, on you know, today's new standard, which is you can't do that stuff. So in any event, um, it's, here's, here's an, a quick little note though. It's okay though for United States politicians, right? A couple of years ago, they're all kneeling in the rotunda with kinte cloth. They were wearing it. Wasn't, isn't that cultural appropriation? That's like, what are you doing? Right, but it was supposed it was supposed to be in honor of a certain individual, by the way, who was in the news because of certain things that happened. And a lot of that story wasn't told properly. So the entire country just absolutely went insane. And of course, we had the thing demic coinciding with all of this tension and people were waiting on a verdict as if it would or could be the end of the world. And so, I don't know, this is way more complicated than it should be, and it shouldn't affect a fairly young guy who is the lead vocalist of a retro rock band 
who basically took most of their cues from Led Zeppelin, and I'm sure Jimi Hendrix, and I'm sure a few other people who they were probably totally enamored with. And they're like, yeah, I wanna dress like that. Yeah, I want our band to have this kind of image. Yeah, that's cool. He didn't sit there and say to himself, oh, I'm hoping that I can offend an entire tribe, right? I, I hope that um, I can go out there and make these people mad at me. I, I doubt that was uh, Josh's intent. And uh, most people would give uh, him the benefit of the doubt, but he's done his mea culpa. He's donating money now to what's called the First Nations Development Program, which uh, helps indigenous traditions. And I'm not sure what they do financially. Uh, what would be cool is if the so-called marginalized co communities here, especially in America, were thought of over, you know, people in another country who we've donated almost $14 billion to. Yeah, if they're here in the United States um, and they're in need, our government should be there for them. I mean, they were grandfathered in as the original American citizens, right? Indigenous Americans, Native Americans, whatever you'd want to call them. But um, we do a lot of showy stuff and we don't do a lot of actual, you know, boots on the ground, rubber meets the road stuff. And I think it's interesting that these articles pop up and they're supposed to make you feel guilty about your own existence, which I don't think helps anybody's cause because people become resentful. Like, I didn't do this. I had no intention of uh, hurting anybody when I dressed up like this or when I went to see, you know, the Atlanta Braves play a baseball game. I, you know, so I'm wondering when those teams are going to get renamed. It's probably going to be fairly soon. Go Cleveland Guardians, right? And the Washington Commanders. Yeah, uh, that's great. It's just awesome. You know, maybe we should just name teams after elements of outer space or the space program, and then everybody will be on the same page and it'll be boring as hell and, you know, whatever. I mean, why, why hold on to a brand or an image that's been successful over decades? Why not just change it and make people really frustrated? They've got to buy new stuff or uh, sort of realign their thinking that, oh, we can't name our team this and we're bad people because we're culturally ignorant, uh, just like Josh Kiska was. So anyway, um, that's my video on the topic. It's This is just sad that a, a pretty cool rock band now has to kind of alter the way they present themselves not to offend certain groups of people. Just It's just kind of nuts, but it is 2022. And I think things are only going to get weirder as time goes on.